Good morning, Stillwater. Y'all stand and sing with us this morning. Good morning, Stillwater. Wow. I tell you what, you know, a, a lot of people come to church to get fed, do they not? And get fed on the Word and get fed by God through our, our pastor. But I just want to tell you something. If you want to feed your pastor, you show up and sing like you did this morning. You worship like you did this morning, and you just, just give it your all, and it will feed that feller over there with that cowboy hat nodding his head, all right? So, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Uh, man, we have been had a busy week this week, um, had a lot of stuff going on at the church. We had what they call a Renew Conference, and that's where um, the AFCC uh, brings in all of the local, or not even local, some not local, some from other states, uh, but they come in, I believe some was from New Mexico, uh, had some from Kansas, but anyway, come in with their wives 
and basically just refresh them, renew them, energize them, encourage them, give them some things that they can go back and do, not to overwhelm them, but to just just take a load off of them, okay? And I just want you to know what your church did. On Friday night, we had a meal, and, and, and I believe Matt told them, he said, okay, we want a meal out here, and we'd like for it to be nice, and, you know, we want to treat these pastors. And I'm going to tell you, You'd have paid a hundred dollars a plate for that meal anywhere else. Okay, first of all, the way it was laid out, the way it was decorated, and then to watch the people of this church serve those pastors would absolutely humble you to the point that you didn't even want to lift your head when you were sitting there. It was unbelievable, and let's just give them all a big round of applause for the way that they did that and the ministry that they had. And don't you think for a second that God will not bless his church that is trying to minister to his ministers, okay? And so just an awesome, awesome weekend that we had. If you're here with us for the first time this morning, I uh, met a couple first-timers that are here today, and so we just want to say thank you. Thank you for giving us a shot. Thank you for showing up, and we're just here to show you more Jesus, okay? It's not anything we want to do, but we just want to show you and reflect him in everything that we do. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you're tuning in online, we thank you for that. <clears throat> And then also, if you want to become a part of Stillwater's Church, we've got a process called G3. It's on the first and second Sundays of each month, and uh, we'd love to have you. It's over in the Kwanzaa Hut, 845. You can text that number. Say, you know what? I want to learn more about this Stillwater's thing. Text that number up there, <clears throat> and then come join us, 845, first and second Sunday of each month. Are you tired of listening to me talk yet? Okay. <laughs> All right, I, I could get that vibe, you know, when your wife's just glaring at you. This is not my wife, but she was she was giving me that glare. So, what's up, Melanie? This is our children's minister. What you got going this morning? Hi, everybody. So we have an event on the 26th. That's Friday, the 26th. It's a women's meet and greet, and it's going to be right here in the main building, starting at 6 p.m. So this is going to be a really great opportunity. Stillwaters has grown so so quickly, and it's really easy, even though we have more people, to feel really alone in a of all these people if you're not making those connections. So this is an opportunity to have just the women of Stillwaters here, allow y'all to make those new connections, you know, kind of kindle some new friendships, and that's going to be a really, really good time. So try to make that for sure. All right, that's on Friday night. On Saturday, the next morning, it's the men's turn. We've got a men's breakfast coming up. Once again, it's a great time. If you're new here, if you if you haven't really got connected or haven't made many relationships, or, or even if if you're old here, <laughs> all right, however that says, but uh, if you're old here and you haven't met all these new people, all right, try to make it next Saturday morning, 9 a.m. for the men's breakfast. And then also, so that's Friday, Saturday, what's happening on Sunday? On Sunday, I'm the most excited about this, um, but I'm partial. I have a right to be yeah, more excited yeah, about this. Yeah, yeah, you're kind of this loaded like there. Thing. Okay. Right. So on Sunday after church, correct? Is that correct. what time it is? Okay, right after church, we're going to have a church conference. So this is open to anybody in the church who wants to attend. And what we are going to be discussing is our new children's facility. So we are going to be bringing y'all more information about that. And this will kind of be, I think, the last step before we... Absolutely, yeah. This this is the last step before dirt gets turned over. All right. So uh, if you if you want to be a part of that, or if you're interested in what all that in, is involved in that, come to that church conference. Uh, Y'all, God is just blessing exponentially from here back that direction for sure. Okay, yeah, we have over thirty and over kids and in a portable building back there, like thirty kids in one little portable building. Yeah, it's that's right, exactly. And we are so thankful for that. But with blessing comes responsibility, does it not? And so that's that's what we're trying to do is just look and see which direction God is guiding us in and how he would have us to move in that. So come to that church conference if you can. It'd be next Sunday right after services. All right. Y'all ready to worship? Well, get up and let's worship. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. And thank you for allowing us to just... Be in your presence and worship your name, God. I pray that through everything we do today and everything we do through the rest of the week just glorifies you and just shows your name through everything, God. Thank you for just loving us and being here. And in your name we pray, amen. So something that stuck out to me this morning just with hearing everybody praise is that Isaiah 43, 21, God refers to his people as a people custom built to praise him. Like we're not just people that praise God. We're people that were made to praise God. So let's, let's praise God this morning.
believe that this morning. Those words are pretty powerful. Um, you are loved by God. I have to remind myself that sometimes. Let's sing that one more time and mean it this time in your heart. Speak that truth. Only God defines who we are. That's it. Nobody's opinion or thoughts or what they think or assume about you defines that. One more time. Your good, good Father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Thank you, Lord. As we're singing, good, good father, somebody comes up and says, 
We got 170 kids back there in the back. We're dragging out tables and chairs and everything we can find. Hmm. He's so good. So good to us. It's nothing we're doing here. It's just his love. It's just pouring out on us. He says, okay, if y'all want to act out in faith, guess what? I'm right there with you. You build it, I'll fill it. Wow. Lord, we love you. Lord, we lift you up. Lord, you are so good to us. God, help us to tune into that. Help us to just, in everything that we have, with every ounce of our being, that we acknowledge and worship you for who you are. For the Father that provides. For the Father that is our banner that goes before us. For the Father that wins victories that we have no clue about. But also for, for the one that just wants to be our friend. That wants to have that personal relationship with us that wants to talk to us each and every day who am i that the king of the world would want to have a relationship with me but lord you're so good to us and you love us lord we lift you up lord as as we dig into your word this morning about parenting lord we just it, this is not just about parenting this is living out the christian life this is being who you want us to be so that you can grow your kingdom through us and through our kids Lord, help us to just seek that. Help us to just have a tenacity that we want to know what the picture is that we're supposed to be trying to attain. Lord, we love you so much. We to speak through our pastor. Lord, we love him so much. Lord, he's a good servant. And we just ask that you fill him with your Holy Spirit and that it's your words coming out and not his. We love you and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, if, if we were to interview your kids, which this, I think this would be fun, okay? Just don't do it to my kids, but I think this would be fun. Great idea, Matt, and that's exactly what we did. We grabbed y'all's kids from this hallway Wednesday night, gave them no prep, and interviewed them about you. This is what they had to say. Stay on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Candy. Um, talking. She likes to read. And she likes to nap. Every morning she reads her Bible. Um, talk, <laughs> work, go shopping, and spend their money. My mom says you're a drama queen because Sometimes they'll just give me like water burger gift cards. Uh, that they show me that they love me by saying no and by whooping me. But I don't see it that way. You know, I see it a different way. Spank you. Spank me. <gasps> Whoop me. Spank me. So whoop me a billion times. Whoop me. It's really bad they spank me. Whoop me. Just about every day. Hold on a second, we're not done. We have some never before seen footage of our very own Eli Comer being interviewed about his parents. What's something that your parents say all the time? Well, my dad is, what are you doing? And then uh, my mom is, mom is, Eli? No, we're not doing that. Eli, no. What do your parents do when you're in trouble? <laughs> Usually when I'm in trouble, uh, yeah, my dad's got this huge battle, and he's so humongous, <laughs> and I get whooped with that every now and then. But, uh, no, I'm, I'm actually grounded right now, so, uh, yeah, so, I didn't get paddled this time, but I... Okay, how do your parents show you that they love you? 
coming by hollering at me. There's a lot of ways, because Dad, after he hollered at me, he's like, I'm just hollering at you because I love you, you know? Oh, man. We got some sneaky people in this church now. Golly. Yes. Oh, man. I don't even know if I can preach now. Golly. Woo! Ain't that good? I tell you what, uh, I'm just so thankful for, uh, for God and, and this church and, and uh, the things that he's doing. And Man, our kids, are, uh, they're, they're funny, aren't they? They're interesting. And they tell the truth, don't they? They tell the truth. and There's, there's no getting around that. And uh, so uh, anyway, we're, uh, I, I, I just, I, I, I did not know they were doing that. So I'm like... <laughs> What do I do now? <laughs> anyway, glad you guys are here, and uh, we are in week two of a parenting series, and uh, so we're so glad that you're here today. If you're a guest with us today, uh, man, we're just thankful that you came to worship at Stillwaters today, and uh, if you're listening online, we are also very grateful for you being a part of our church today, and uh, so, hey, we're in Proverbs chapter 22 Verse 6, this is our base scripture, and then uh, I want to flip over to Matthew chapter 7 is kind of where I want to kind of be home base today, and and, uh, we're going to continue today. I want to talk to you about the culture in the home, the culture in the home. Uh, And so Proverbs 22, 6, you know that it just says to train up a child uh, in the way that he should go, or the New Living Translation said direct children onto the right path, and we know that the right path is the biblical path, is it not? It's God's Word, and so we need that in our homes, and so that is the right path, and then when they are older, they will not depart from it, and there's something about kids that when they're at a young age, especially, we don't really realize, but when kids are, uh, you know, four, five, six years old, I mean, they learn so much in those early developmental stages of their brain and they're learning things that are very important. And it will surprise you how smart those kids are in those classrooms back there when it comes to God's Word and what they really understand. Uh, and so I know that, you know, even, even I think about this in myself, understanding that I was saved at, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, exactly how old I was. I want to say it was, uh, I think, in the, the Bible that was given to me when I got baptized. I, I can remember it said 1986 on it. And so if that's true, then I was seven years old or somewhere close to seven, and I remember understanding that I needed Jesus Christ in my life. And sometimes we look at kids and six, seven years old, and we say, well, I don't know if they really understand the gospel. I don't know if they understand that. And maybe I didn't fully understand it until later on or fully feel the weight of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. But I understood that I needed a relationship with Christ and that God sent His Son to die on a cross for me in that love of the Father, amen? That love of the Father, that He would do that for me to have a relationship with me. I understood that at a young age, and I received Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I prayed, and, and, uh, and, I, and I pray that you have done that today. And so if, you, uh, if you're here today and, and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, hey, there's some of these principles that we're going to share with you today. They're going to work just because... Uh, God is the author of life. He is the author of creation. The way that he has set things up, when we do things his way, they just work, okay? Uh, But if you're not uh, saved today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, um, you're you're missing out on the greatest relationship ever ever known to man, okay? Uh, And so that's what we are about. And so anyway, uh, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. Now flip over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, uh, maybe as a, a familiar uh, kind of parable, it's not really a parable, but it, uh, it's, it's the words of Jesus, and he talks about uh, building our lives on a firm foundation. I'm going to share a few things with you, not a whole lot, um, but I'm going to share a few things with you today about our culture, the American culture, and where we're at, and I think we could all agree today that, that we're kind of in a shifty culture. Where that, like America, we could say that we have, we have uh, went far away from firm foundation. Um, we have all kinds of beliefs today and all kinds of things that we're griping and arguing and fighting over. 
But Jesus says this is how we build our lives. We build it on a firm foundation. So in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24, he says this. Anyone who listens to my teaching, now catch this, and follows it, is wise. Like a person who builds his house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in uh, torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and does not obey it is foolish. Like the person who builds his house on the sand. And when a person who builds his house, uh, or when the rains come and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And so basically today what I want to do is I want to share with you uh, how do we build a stronger culture in our homes than the culture that's in the world? How do we do that? Uh, and so I want to share a few things with you today. So let's, let's uh, can't never get enough prayer. So let's just one more time ask the Holy Spirit to speak today. Father, we are uh, <clears throat> very thankful that you are a, a good, good father. And Lord, as I uh, stood over there and sang that song this morning, I am, I am so thankful that um, you are perfect because I am not. <laughs> and that my kids, Lord, they have a very imperfect father. But Lord, I'm thankful that you will never, ever, ever fail us or let us down. And you will, you will love us, Father, through thick and thin. And so, Lord, today I pray that you would just reveal to us today from your Holy Spirit uh, the things that we need to know to be about your business and for your kingdom and impact in the next generation in our own homes today. The, 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 the culture within our homes, Father, would be uh, built on a firm foundation. And, uh, Lord, it would be stronger than the culture of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was in college, uh, I took a class, and it was an uh, animal science class, and in that class, we had to, <laughs> get this, uh, literally kill a chicken, <laughs> debone it, and glue it back together. <laughs> what a class, right? That was, that was a, one of the funnest things ever. And uh, so we, anyway, I remember our, our professor, Dr. Cherry, he came in and he brought a bunch of chickens in. Of course, you got uh, girls and boys. And of course, all the girls are like, oh my gosh, how, how, how could you do this? And, uh, you know, he said, well, if you, if you want to do it, you know, the, the humane way, which is the, really the humane way is to just pull the head, pull the you know, chicken's head off. Uh, or wring his neck, you know, as grandma used to do back in the day. Uh, but it, it, it literally, he said, if you want to do it the inhumane way, which is to everybody else would be the humane way, you know, we've got gas and you can, you can gas the chickens. And so there's all the girls that put their chickens in a uh, trash bag in the trash can and they put a hose of gas over into it, okay? Welcome to Cowboy Church, okay? <laughs> Yeah, this is in college, in class, and literally, it's a true story, put the hose of CO2 or whatever it was, you know, closed up the, the trash bag around the hose, and you hear the chickens in there, and I'm like, that's humane, really? Come on, you know, of course, we're, we've already got ours, the guys, we've already got our chicken killed, you know, we're deboning it, you know, they're listening to this, you know, chaos go on over here. And, uh, but anyway, I remember that was one of the funnest things that I've ever done, uh, not killing the chicken, but <laughs> putting it back together. And uh, so you had to boil down the meat and all of that and save the bones and everything. And I remember that I used super glue. Uh, no, I, no, we used uh, hot glue to put the chicken back together. And of course, I you know, made a little wooden stand where it stand up and everything, you know, and and uh, cleaned it with a toothbrush, and it was a very intricate process. And I remember being proud. You know, he turned it in for a grade and everything, and I remember being proud of that chicken skeleton. Oh, I wish I had that thing today. <laughs> but in college, you know, you kind of move around a little bit, you know, and back then I had a Ford F-150, and I could fit all my stuff in the passenger seat of the F-150. It was just a single cab. And I remember that that prized chicken skeleton and I set it right there on the console. And man, I'm driving, you know, I'm, I'm headed to my new place. I got all my stuff packed in. I'm moving to an apartment or wherever I was going. I don't remember. But I remember that day 
and uh, it was very hot. It was in the summertime, and I remember <laughs> leaving that chicken skeleton in the vehicle, and I came back, you know, after a hot summer day, you know, turned the car off or the truck off, and I remember that all that work was now in a pile of bones <laughs> on that piece of wood, you know, and of course, you know, glue is everywhere, you know, and uh, so I, I remember, I remember that, and I, you know, I thought, man, I, I, I got to put this thing back together, and of course, you know, I just, I just never did. I wish I would have, but I wish I did, and you know, if, if the, the thing is about uh, that vehicle, if I had prepared, and if I was smart, okay, and I had prepared for the elements of the world that were trying to come into my vehicle and tear up everything that I had built, I should have left the engine running, right? If I was, if I was thinking ahead and I was prepared and I knew that, hey, there was, there was something out there that wanted to get inside here, man, I would have left the engine running and left the air conditioner on and protected what I had worked so hard to build. And I know that that's a crazy funny story, but uh, the next time you think about your home, maybe you'll think about a chicken bones, okay? Or next time you eat a rotisserie chicken this afternoon, okay? You'll remember this. But here's what I here's what I need you to understand that in our homes, and this is what this is what Matthew 7 says, that that in our lives, especially in our homes, that there are elements of the world that are going to come and they're going to want to tear apart and destroy what you've built. And here's what you got to understand. We have got to leave the engine of faith running. We have to, leave our, we have to keep our faith going. We have to keep our faith strong. we got to keep gas in the gas tank because we got to protect the inside because the elements on the outside are trying to come in and destroy everything that you've worked so hard to build. And some of you understand that all too closely this morning. And we know that, man, our, our lives have got to be built on the foundation, but some of us, we're in the life of faith and the life of uh, following Christ and the life of being obedient to Him. Our, our faith is like on and off, on and off, on and off. And I'm telling you that there's just, there's, there's consequences for that. There's consequences for that. And we've got to leave the engine of faith running at all times. And so I just want to uh, point out a couple of things here that there's a, there's a wise man and there's a foolish man, but the storm comes to both houses. Just because the wise man built his house upon the rock doesn't mean that the storm's not going to come. It's going to come, okay? It's going to come. But because you built your life on something that is more solid, that's built on the Word of God, that's built on relationships with Christ, that, you, that, you're, that the things that you do in your home are built around uh, the church and the body of Christ and, and impacting the kingdom of God. And when you build your life on those things, when the storm comes, Man, you, you'll be a whole lot better off and you'll be standing firm at the end. But if we think that we can just listen and hear and not actually do what James says, hey, let's not just be hearers of the word only, let's be doers of the word. Let's actually put into practice what we've done, what we've heard. That when we, if we would just hear something but we don't do it, a great collapse is coming. A great collapse is coming. And, I, and, I, and I, I know we say that today, and maybe some of you have been in some areas like that. Maybe you're in a wreck today. Maybe the storms have come, and man, it's, it's just wrecked out your whole house, wrecked out your whole family. I want you to know that, hey, God's grace and His mercy is still available, and that He is in the restoration business. Amen? Okay, that's who He is. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, you, that if you're here today, and, and, and as a pastor, I can prepare you for that. Let's be prepared for it, okay? Uh, and so I want to show you a couple of graphs, and uh, I don't do this a whole lot, but I want to show you a couple of graphs of just where we're at in, in America, because I think you need to know this. I think you need to know where the trends of faith are, are heading, okay? So we look back in about 1950. This is America's religious preferences. Now, I, you, you know me. I'm not about religion. I'm about relationship in Christ, but some of these when they do these polls and things, most people identify with religion or religious activities, okay? And so 
Uh, this is America's religious preference. The green is Christian. Blue is non-Christian. And the dots there, the red dots are no religion. So notice that about 1950, about 90% of people's religious preference was Christian. Christian values. Christian principles. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Okay, But notice now that uh, over in 2020, we're down to less than, go back, we're down to less than 70%. And you say, well, that's still pretty good. I mean, that's almost two-thirds, okay? But let me, let me say something here. Does America look like a Christian nation today? But if two, but two thirds, let's think about this. If two thirds, 69%, identify with Christian religious values, then two thirds of our nation should look like Christ. <laughs> but it doesn't, okay? Now, here's the one that, that I want to point out because the non Christians just kind of stay the same down there at the bottom. They don't have a lot of change. But I want you to notice something about the people that are identifying with no religion whatsoever, with nothing. The, what they actually call this. Uh, the nuns, okay? Uh, the rise of the nuns is what they call it. And that ain't your Catholic nun that's, you know, Mother Mary and Teresa. This is like, I don't want to have no part of church. I don't want to have no part of Christ because if that's what church looks like and that's what Christ looks like, it ain't for me. 21, if we go from barely anybody was non-religious in 1950 to now we're up to 20% of the people identify non-religious. Now, go to the next slide. This is the importance of religion to Americans. How important is it to us? Now, so almost the same, about 70% back in 1955, 1965. But see how much that drops to less than 50% in 2020. We, we said, you know, it's very, 70% said it's very important back in 1965, but yet now we move to 2020 and we're less than 50%. And then you notice, you know, fairly important, you know, kind of stays the same. But again, the ones that are saying that it's not very important is on the rise. It's, 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 it's on the rise. Now, uh, I, I want to go back to the slide before that because I, I, I think this is it. I noticed it. No, no, I'm sorry. It's the other one. <clears throat> so watch this. If, you'll, if you can notice this, barely, look, at, look at 2020 and look at, the very end of the green line. Notice how it dips. And then in 2020, guess what happens? It just barely comes up a little bit. Just barely starts coming back up a little bit. I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. That gives me hope. Because of all the things that we've been through in 2020 and 2021 and now 2022... That gives me hope. That sometimes, it, and of course, Hebrews 5.8, this is not in my message, but he's, Hebrews 5.8 says this, that Jesus learned suffering, no, Jesus learned obedience through suffering. This gives me hope. <laughs> because in 2020, we've had one of the worst years of our lives, amen? And then 2021, it's like, what the heck, okay? And now they're talking about monkeypox. You know, of course, you know, my wife's a nurse, and she gets all these emails about what's coming and protocol and this and that, you know? And, uh, and she's like, oh, we're doing it again. You know, here it comes. So anyway, but when, when it's, it's like Jesus tells us, he, he gives us the answers, right? And, and it's like sometimes he's teaching us obedience through the hardships that we have to suffer. So that gives me hope, okay? That gives me hope that maybe we're back up on that trending back towards that. And now that's what I want to talk about today because America really is a country today. You can take those down. America really is a country today that would identify with Christian values, but the way we live our lives, what we say we believe doesn't match what we actually do in our homes and in our culture, okay? Uh, so we find today that uh, the, there, there is a rise of uh, people that uh, are not getting married. There is a rise and there is a, a momentum that's being built in homosexuality. 
and transgenderism. There's a rise in, uh, in, in abortion rights and all of that. And th- so thankfully, hey, we're, we're making some progress there, okay? Uh, we're always working on those things and trying to pull, right? We're trying to pull our, our families and our, our communities and our nation back to the biblical principles that this country was founded on, Right? And I know that some of y'all, it, that's, it, that's kind of taboo to you, because they're like, no, we don't need to talk about that, okay? Because I got friends that believe this or believe that, you know, and I don't want to offend anybody, I don't want to make anybody mad. But the truth is, that Jesus is going to come back one day. And I would rather him find me and my family faithful to his word than compromising just to make friends with the world. And so we've got to stand up for what the Word of God says. And I, and I say all of that just to tell you today that it, I think it's, it, there's nothing is ever very simple. But I think it's um, very important for us as families and as parents to stop turning the key off to the engine of faith. Stop turning the vehicle off. You got to keep it going. You got to you got to you got to you got to rev the engine sometimes. Sometimes you're you're in life and you're going fast. Sometimes you're going slow, but we've got to keep that that key to the on position and keep the faith on. And so you know that Romans 12 says that we cannot be conformed to the image of this world. That we're called to be different. And we're called to live this life in in following Christ. And so last week, you know, we said that uh, man, our, the main goal of parenting is just to raise up and release kids who love Jesus, follow Jesus, and will live on mission for Jesus. That's our job. And so you can't do that if you're turning the key of faith on and off, on and off, on and off, okay? Again, the elements of the world, you can probably testify to the fact that they have come in and they've uh, ruined what you've tried to build in your home. And so today I want this message to be uh, not just uh, telling you what has happened or, or uh, not just telling you what you, what you already know. I want you to be able to build this character, this culture uh, in your home that's stronger than the culture of the world. And so I want to give you some practical things today. And so let's just be clear, real, real, real quick, let's just be clear that what, what, what is culture? What is culture? Culture is a, it's a set of beliefs that are followed by our behaviors. Culture starts with our beliefs. Like the culture of this church is, a, is an outward, uh, evangelistic, word of God culture, right? We, we value certain things. We value gathering together. We value growing in Christ. And, and we value going and making a difference. So, that, so that's the culture here. It starts with a set of beliefs. And those beliefs are followed by a set of practices that we do. We actually do what we say we want to do, right? And so in your home, the same is true. Like, what, what are the, what's, the, what's the culture in your home? And you can ask that question by asking this question, what do I really believe and what am I really doing? Because what I really believe is what, my actions are going to follow that, okay? And so we, we can't control what uh, the, the outside world culture is doing, but we can control the kind of culture that we want to maintain and, and build within our own homes. We can do that because that starts with us as parents. That doesn't start with your kids. That starts with you as a parent. And so we, we, we establish these certain behaviors as parents based on our beliefs on the Word of God. Okay? And so today what I want to do is I want to share with you just... Uh, Three necess- not, it won't be today. I'm going to share with you three necessities to a healthy culture in the home. I'm going to give you two today, and then I'll give you the next one, uh, the third one next, next Sunday. And the one next Sunday will be good, because uh, Eli talked about, I, I do have a red oak, very large paddle at home. It's from my old school teaching days, all right? I brought it home with me, and uh, yes, it has helped me and Shelby out quite a bit. Anyway, that's, that's going to be next week, okay? But uh, today I want to talk to you uh, on a couple, couple of things. Three necessities to a healthy culture in the home. Number one is this, is uh, a unified marriage. A unified marriage. Uh, now, when I, when I say unified marriage, I, I need you to understand that, you know, in Ephesians 5, 31, the Scripture says, hey, uh, marriage is a great mystery, 
But it's an illustration of the way Christ and his church are one, okay? And so the scripture says that, hey, when, when two people marry, the two people become one. You, you unify yourselves with one another and you become one. Now, isn't it interesting that a lot of times that kids and our children somehow have a way of dividing us? And so when I say unified marriage, I'm not only talking about uh, you and your spouse being on the same page, but I'm talking about that your kids understand that you and your spouse are on the same page, okay? And so, so we have to protect that. And so sometimes when we think about a unified marriage, we just think about, well, the two are united into one. Here, here, you know, we're together. But then if we're together and we have kids, then we have to parent together. And we have to be on the same page together. And so one of the keys to raising good kids, listen to me, is to have a great marriage. One of the keys to raising great kids is to have a great marriage. Now, I can tell maybe some of you are sitting out there today, and you're like, well, I'm a single mom, okay, or I'm a single dad, or we're going through a divorce or whatever, okay? Hey, I'm, we're, we're going to bring a message on a blended family, okay? And again... The grace and the mercy, the forgiveness, and the restoration that God can bring, okay, to broken families, okay? Uh, so uh, that, that'll come later. But one of the keys to raising great kids is to have a great marriage. And your kids really will learn more about God through your relationship with one another. As they watch you, and they watch you interact with one another, and they watch you be one with each other, They'll learn more about God through your relationship and how the husband treats the wife and how the wife treats the husband. And they'll learn more about the oneness of the marriage than, than, than they will from anything else. And remember, there's, some of these things are going to be redundant, but you've got to remember, as we said last week, that uh, it is still true that you as a parent, are your, you are your kid's number one influence in their life. They will listen to you and they will watch you more than their coach, more than their teacher, more than their pastor, more than their Sunday school teacher or whatever. They will listen to you. You have greater influence on their lives than any other person in their life. You do. And that's why you see so many people. You see so many people grow up with trauma in their life. Usually that trauma goes back to a parent. Well, when I grew up, my dad, or I grew up, my mom, and when I grew up, man, you know, this, that my mom and my dad, that, you know. And so, so what happens in our childhood, it affects our adulthood. And I'm just trying to tell you today that the greatest way that you can impact your kids for the greater good of God and knowing who He is, is to have a unified marriage, is to be on the same page, okay? And so they, they will actually learn more about relationships through your marriage that has been modeled in front of them. And they will learn more about priorities of life and what really matters in life by what you prioritize in life and by what really matters to you in life. And so if you're, you're a married couple with kids, uh, you cannot, listen to me, you cannot let your kids hijack your life with your spouse. Don't let them hijack that. And so what does that mean? I'm, I'm going to give you three things real quick. Uh, in, in relation to a unified marriage, okay? Uh, how, how do we do that? How do we not let our kids hijack our life? How do we not let them become more important? I know some of this is kind of maybe hard for you to hear. If you're hearing this for the first time, you're like, eh, I ain't much more important than my kids, okay? Well, if you're married, you, here's number one. You need to prioritize your marriage over your children. You need to prioritize your marriage over your children, Okay? Uh, say, well, uh, show me that in the Bible. Okay, uh, Adam and Eve were married first, and then God gave them kids. He gave them each other first. Which, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I'm on a chicken roll today, all right? <laughs> which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> Nobody knows still. <laughs> I, think God, I think God put a chicken down on the earth. When he, okay. uh, which came first, the marriage or the kids? Yeah. Now, in, 
Yeah, hopefully. Okay, now again, I, <laughs> y'all don't understand how hard this is for me, okay? I'm trying to be sensitive to your situations out there, okay? Yeah, but, but truthfully, the way God designed it is you can't have kids unless you have intimacy with your spouse. <laughs> but what happens is, is a lot of times kids have a way of getting in, not, they're not getting in the way, but sometimes they just, they, they require a lot of time and attention and all that kind of stuff. And if we're not careful, we'll end up devoting more time and attention to our kids than to our spouse. Because here's what's going to happen. And here's, here's where counselors are today. And many, many counselors, you, you realize that uh, the, there are more divorces today in the golden years of life than there's ever been. The people are, the people are have, they're having 25, 30 years of marriage and then getting divorced. That used to never happen. If you could make it 10 or 15 years, like, you know, it's Sayonara, we got this deal, right? But nowadays, that's not true. And what happened, and you see it, we watch it, you know, we got to be careful of it in our own family that you see this where everybody's life is revolved around these little bitty people. And everything that their agendas are requiring of us. And then we, so we give our whole lives to what's going on with these kids. And we've sacrificed our relationship with our spouse. And then when those kids leave one day, we look at each other and we go, who are you? I don't, I don't know. I like you very much. And we're spending time together. That's all we got together. And it's all because maybe we've neglected some of that relationship time because we gave it all to our kids, okay? And I, I'm just saying, it, it's, it's not, a, not that your kids don't, don't need time and attention and that you don't need to be involved in things in their lives, but we have to be careful about what we prioritize. And I'm just telling you today, man, it's, I, just, I almost get teary-eyed thinking about this because I just, I just know today that what will help your kids more in the long run is not that you burn 42 tanks of gas getting them to every little thing during the week, but what will help them more than anything is seeing mom and dad who love each other and are unified and are on the same page and are still pursuing one another and are setting time aside for one another. Because guess what's going to happen? They're going to they're going to look for a spouse that looks a lot like the marriage you model in front of them. They are. And so you have to prioritize your marriage over your children. The second one is this, is that you have to make decisions in agreement. You have to make decisions in agreement, okay? Uh, just funny scenario here, okay? Kid walks in, uh, Dad, can I have a Pop-Tart for supper? Sure, I don't care. Kid goes and starts eating a Pop-Tart. Mom walks in. What are you doing eating a Pop-Tart? I cook supper. Dad said I could. Why are you letting her eat a Pop-Tart for supper? I cook supper. Okay, so they ask one question. Dad's the one that gets in trouble, but the kid who's the one that committed the action. <laughs> Yeah, they, and, yeah and, and you know, like they're just sitting over eating a, part, a pop tart, enjoying it, and dad's the one that got in trouble. Okay, this scenario has played out many times, I promise you. And so, so, and, and this most, most of this goes for the guys, okay, but some of this might go for, for the, the wives and the girls too. But here's the thing you, you know, how when, when, you, when you're in agreement with one another, there has to be communication, okay? There has to be communication, okay? It's like, well, how, how, I mean, I, how, do, how am I supposed to know that they're not supposed to have Pop-Tarts for supper? Okay. The, uh, the, the Scripture also says to live with your wife in an understanding way. And so you need to think about when you're, th I mean, kids will, they will, they'll trick, they're tricky. <laughs> tricky, tricky, tricksters. Okay, and so you have to be careful when they come and ask you a question. You have to think that there's somebody else that I make decisions with, there's somebody else that I that I need to make sure that we're 
together on when they're doing this. Okay, now here's one of the ones, I, and I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna, hopefully I'm gonna help a lot of people out. And we kind of gotten past these days, but when a, when a kid hits about 10, 11, 12 years old, there's there's something that they they always do. Every kid does it. Okay, and it's so annoying. Okay, they go grab a friend. And they walk up to you with that friend standing there. Can they spend the night? And what we do as parents, because we don't really want that kid to spend the night at our house, okay, and we don't want to tell that to him, to his face, him or her, okay, and so what we do is we say, go ask your mom. <laughs> that way, if they say yes, we can blame it on them, Right? We didn't have no part of it, okay? And so that, and so, and some, and let me, let me just time out here, a little bit serious, but if, if a, if a kid ever asked for your, you know, if somebody ever asked for your kid to go over to somebody's house and you're not comfortable with it, do not ever, ever, ever feel guilty for saying no. Don't. If it's not, if you feel like, man, I, I don't know what goes on over there. I don't know what kind of parents those are. I don't know them very, very well yet. It is way okay. Listen, I, let, let, it will be okay. <laughs> okay? Uh, so that's just a side note there. But what happens a lot of times is, is if you're not on the same page, when those kids begin to come ask those questions, then it's, it's going to be a source of contention and a source of disagreement. Okay? And so what you have to do is, this is what we did, is we said, hey, uh, Eli, Emery, don't ever, <laughs> ever bring a friend and come ask me if they can spend, spend the night in front of me, okay? Now, if you want somebody to come spend the night, that's fine. You ask me beforehand, and then it, we'll let you go ask their parents, or we'll ask their parents, okay? But you don't bring them up right here in front of me. And, and a lot of times, the parents standing over there because they want a date night, <laughs> And they're like, they're sitting over here going, oh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, they're okay. And I'm like, you will let us set that up, okay? So there's some things that you have to prepare for beforehand, okay? And I'm just saying you have to make decisions in agreement. And you have to think about what would, as a mom or as a dad, you have to think about, well, what would mom say? What would dad say? And if you're on the same page and you're communicated about those things, then it'll be a whole lot better for you. Okay, so most arguments happen because of a lack of communication. You get in disagreements because there's something happened that you didn't know was going to happen. And so communication is so, so very important. And here, here's the third one. You have to honor each other and don't allow your kids to dishonor one another in front of your spouse. Okay. Honor each other in front of your kids and never, ever allow your kids to dishonor your spouse in front of y'all, okay? Or not, not ever, period, okay? Uh, so <clears throat> we're talking about a unified marriage here, and so we're, we have to honor each other. So disagreements that you have, you can, you can handle them in a way of honor. You know how that works? Don't, don't get in a heated argument in front of your kids. Just don't do it. I realize that's hard. <laughs> Is it not? <laughs> Don't get in a heated argument in front of your kids. Some things maybe you need to take back into the bedroom. Some things you need to, might need to say, let's just take a deep breath right now. Okay? And some, sometimes one person just being quiet will diffuse the situation. Okay? Instead of going back and forth. But... Uh, disagreements should be handled in private. Now, there's going to be little arguments here and there. I mean, we're, we're human, okay? Those things happen. A lot of those things, sometimes those things happen in front of the kids. But I'm talking about if you, if you feel yourself getting to the point where you're very heated, you're about to have a knockdown drag out, okay? The, the worst thing you can do is to do that in front of the children, and I say that today knowing <laughs> that we've probably all been there before. And I don't say that with guilt and shame and condemnation, okay? But somebody, we've got we to call these things out. And we've got to be different, okay? 
We've got, we've got to live by the way God calls us to live. And so kids should never see their parents uh, in a heated disagreement. Um, so what happens, though, when a kid sees uh, their parents arguing with one another, they see that as permission to argue. So you got to think about that, you know, as, they, as you're, you're just going back and forth at one another, okay, they see that, that you're modeling that in front of them. And so that gives them permission to do that. And uh, I don't, I'm not going to tell the story on, on Eli, but um, <clears throat> he, he had a ar- little argument with a, a pre-K teacher one time. And uh, I, I brought my, I was actually teaching at the time, and uh, we were headed to, y'all want to hear the story? <laughs> Would you give me permission to tell the story? <laughs> So Eli walks into a pre-K class, and the, the teacher's aide tells him to uh, put his backpack up. And he goes, he said, no. She said, Eli, put your backpack up. And he proceeds to say, I don't have to listen to you. <laughs> she said, well, you're going to the office. This is before school started, okay? And, uh, and so we're, I am loaded down with heifers going to Fort Worth, Texas, okay, for, for an ag show. And Mr. Bruce Hawkins calls me. He was a principal at the time. He goes, Mr. Matt, he said, we've got Eli in the office, and he's had a little issue with the teacher. I said, what happened? He says, well, he, he told her that he didn't have to listen to her. I made a U-turn. <laughs> and I drove to the elementary school, and I walked in. Of course, you've got to know Mr. Bruce Hawkins. I love him to death. Uh, he was a great principal, but uh, he said, uh, well, you know, I was thinking, you know, whatever, you know, if you want to talk to him first. I said, where's your paddle at? He said, well, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if it was that big of a deal. I said, no, we're finna settle it. Well, he won't never do this again, okay? And Eli, he hates to get uh, spankings. And so I said, bend over the desk. No, daddy, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, the whole uh, school heard it. And uh, Mr. Bruce, he never called me again. It's like... <laughs> He wasn't much on, on battling kids, but uh, he's like, man, I, I didn't mean to cause all that. And I said, well, you'll, you'll never have to call me again. So anyway, <laughs> dishonor, though. And, and if they see that, man, it feel, it's like that gives them permission to do that, okay? So that, that, is, um, that is the unified marriage, all right? If we want to build a healthy culture in our home that's stronger than the culture of the world, you and your spouse have to be on the same page. Agree? Here's the second one. If we want to build a strong culture in our home, we have to have unconditional love. Unconditional love. Now, when God says, now, let, let me read a couple of scriptures here. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We know this is, this, this is the love passage. Um, but I'm going to, golly, I shouldn't have told that story. Um, <laughs> I think you've had enough. I, are, you, are you okay? <clears throat> oh, I should have split this up into three parts. But um, So 1 Corinthians 13 says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no records of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices when the truth we in love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful. It endures through every circumstance. Now, here's, here's what you need to understand about when the Scripture says love. Some of your translations may say charity. But when, it, when the Scripture uses this word love, the word is agape. And agape literally means unconditional. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't perform for it. You just get it. And this is the kind of love that he's saying. So if we replace the word love with the word that's actually uh, in the Greek, it's agape. It's agape is patient. Unconditional agape is patient. Unconditional agape is not jealous. It's not proud. It's not rude. Agape never gives up. Agape never loses faith. Agape is always hopeful. Agape endures through every single circumstance. Okay, First John chapter 4, which is... Uh, talks a lot about love. And it talks about not only God, how he loves us, but how our love needs to be like the same love God has for us for one another. And so in First John, he says, we know how much God agapes us 
We know how much He unconditionally loves us. And we have put our trust in His agape. So God is agape. And all who live in agape live in God. And, and, uh, and God lives in them, okay? And so here's, here's what I need you to understand about unconditional love. Is you can't have agape in your marriage or in your family unless you've received the agape from God. And this is 90, I would say this is probably 95% of our issues is unconditional love, that we don't love other people around us, or we're putting expectations and things on our spouse, and we have disagreements with our spouse because we're not agapeing them. We're not loving them unconditionally. Because they didn't do this, then I'm going to withhold my love from you. And your kids are watching this. That something happens, you know, they did this or they did that, okay? And your kids are watching how you unconditionally love them. And 90% of our, our issues in life, a lot of 90% of the, the parenting issues that we have go back to mom and dad issues. And how they, did, did they unconditionally love us? And so your kids are going to learn more about uh, God uh, in, in his love by the way that you are, re- not the way you're loving them, by the way you're receiving the agape love of God. Okay? I think this maybe is a little bit new for some of you to hear. And so God's love for us, listen, does not change based on what we did yesterday. It does not change. Uh, God doesn't need you to do anything for you to love him. He loves you because he chooses you. And in a marriage relationship, this almost turned into a marriage series. Like, I thought this was a parenting series. It is a parenting series. Okay? But in, in, in your, the way that you are loving each other unconditionally and choosing each other every single day and choosing to be in agreement okay, is, is giving your kids a picture of how God is choosing us every single day, and He's loving us unconditionally, okay? So God wills to love us. Another way to understand agape love is just in the fact that God's emotions do not change about you. And so what happens in our our lives, because our emotions are up and down, and we have struggle kind of keeping our emotions in check, you know, ah, why did you do that? And then our kids get a picture of God going, ah, why did you do that? And that's not who God is. That's not who God is. And so if we'll receive this unconditional love of God, we receive this agape love for ourselves, okay, then we're ready to give that agape love to our family. How do you do that? Here's how you do that. You wake up every single morning and you be in relationship with God. And you be in His Word. And you be in prayer. And you receive, you confess, you receive the forgiveness, you receive his mercy, and you believe in your mind that what happened yesterday, God's forgiven it, and he still sees you as holy and righteous, not based on your performance, but based on what Christ did on the cross. And you receive that every single morning. And when you receive that every single morning, that you are loved by God, you have a purpose for God, that He is using you, He is working things out in your life, okay? When you receive that for yourself, you're ready to give that to your family. Okay? And that, that's, that's how that works. And so um, we, just, we just know that uh, what God pour, what we allow God to pour into us is what's going to come out of us. Okay? Uh, how many of you would say that you grew... Now, you don't have to raise your hand. But how many of you would say that you grew up with an emotional parent? All, hands would be up all over the place, okay? We grew up with an emotional parent. And most of us would say that a lot of our issues come from our, uh, the ups and downs, you know. And, and we look back on our, our lives as kids and we see, you know, man, my dad was... He was... Up and down all the time. Uh, and that's why it's so important for us to um, try to build this faith culture in our home as much as possible and point everything back to Christ. Uh, I'm, I'm getting close to being done. John Cooper said this. He, he is the co-founder of the Christian band Skillet. 
Um, if you're over 50, don't look that band up. <laughs> You'll figure that out later. But they are Christian. Uh, but he said this about his kids. He said, we have no aspirations for our children outside of them serving Christ. Man, what if, we, what if we took on, what if every single family took on that mentality? I have no aspirations, I have no expectations for my kids outside of serving Christ. That's huge. That's huge. I, I, and so I just ask yourself this question as the band comes back up. I would, I, I, would, uh, I would ask you to ask yourself this question. These questions. <clears throat> What's it like being a child with me as, as their parent? What's it like? What, what are they living through? Do my kids know that my love for them is not based on their performance? I had a friend back when I was in Little League Baseball, and he would have bruises on his back because when he would... Uh, in batting practice at home, his dad would pitch to him, and if he missed hitting the ball, his dad would throw the ball and hit him in the back. H how do we know that our, how do our kids know that our love for them is not based on their performance? Do my emotions run high whenever my child doesn't meet my expectations? Do my kids know that there is nothing they can do? Listen to me. Watch this. There's nothing they can do that will ever make me love them any less. Amen. I've told uh, Eli and Emery many times, and I've, I've told him, I said, man, listen, just understand. I've told him this several times in his life. I said, understand, there is, you can come to me with anything, anything anything if you ever find yourself in a bind or you've done something you shouldn't have or you've done something stupid or whatever okay like the first thing you need to think is not need to hide from my dad and i need to go to my dad you can come to me with anything okay and so as i ask those questions let's ask them in a little different sense this morning what's it like being a child of god the father What's it like for you being a child of God the Father? Has, has, has God not proven his love for us based on our performance? No. Based on what he's done for us. And, and so does his emotions run high when we sin? Is there anything that we can do that would make God love us any less? If the one thing you get today is I'm just saying just it, it's... I, I think the word is receive from God so that you can give to your family. All right? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, I just pray for every single parent here today. I, my, my, our goal is not to uh, bring guilt and shame and condemnation upon parents. But Lord, to, to get better and to grow as a godly parent, as a parent that's building our homes on a firm foundation, on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that if there's some parents here today that maybe need to make some apologies or, or uh, make some restoration, Lord, with their kids, Lord, I pray you give them the courage to do that as hard as that is. Lord, give them humility. Give them the help they need. Give them the words. Lord, more, more than anything, Father, help us to understand how much of a good, good Father you are to us. And if when we understand that, Father, and we receive that for ourselves, Lord, it flows out of us. And so, Lord, give it to us. Thank you for your word and what you're doing. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, I talked about those of you that maybe need to receive Christ today. If you haven't done that, Come see us, okay? That's where it starts. If you need prayer today, whatever it might be, we got people over here, ladies and men, over here. Come get prayer, whatever you need. Let's stand, let's sing this last song, respond to God and what He's told us.
Have a great week.